I do have a habit of speaking rather loudly, so. Uh, okay, so we're here to talk about property rights, and the first thing I'd like to say is that um, there's a bit of confusion around what property rights actually are. Everyone thinks that, okay, I've got property, and then I've got rights. And regularly, if I ask people, okay, what, what are property rights? They go, oh, well, I'm not so sure. You know, it's what I can do. There's one fundamental thing that we all need to understand, and that is that our rights, in relation to freehold land particularly, this is what we're talking about here, our rights are our property. We own them, okay? They're not something that just floats around for government to steal bits of for your neighbour or the bloke down the road to take advantage of. It is your property, okay? Your, your right to use your land is an element of your property that you own, you paid for it, and essentially it is the most valuable element of property that you will ever own. Because if you take away the right to use your land, the land itself is worth nothing, absolutely nothing. It doesn't matter how good the soil is, you know, what, what the vegetation's like, how good the rainfall is. If you don't have the right to use it, it's worthless. You derive the benefit from that land out of your right to use it. Whether you produce food with it, whether you graze cattle, whether you adjust it or lease it out to somebody else, at the end of the day, you and your community derive their economic existence from your right to use your land. That is paramount. It is so important. So I'll just give you a brief outline of, of my situation, I guess. Um, I, I purchased a property, our property, about 2003 to run a grazing business. So at that time, I sought out grazing land. Now many of you are probably aware of the fact that throughout Australia land is classified by government into primary land uses. Whether you know that or not, your, your little parcel of earth has a primary land use in the eyes of government. Whether it be residential, commercial, agricultural, it has a primary land use. So I thought I was doing the right thing. I wanted to run a grazing business, so I purchased grazing land west of Charleville and with the whole desire to run a grazing business. So that's what I set about doing, grazing livestock. Out where we are, I'm not sure what, if you're aware of it, but we have vegetation called mulga. That's a scrubby type of a tree, it's hardly, a, hardly a millable timber or a fantastic looking forest, but it's very good forage for livestock. And that's essentially what our livestock industry lives off is off that vegetation. Just like somewhere around here, you might, have, um, you might have grass, you might have a paddock of lacina, you might have just native pasture to, to, you know, to run your grazing business. Out there, we have mulga. So I purchased mulga, classified for grazing, and I set about grazing in 2004. Now, in 2014, along come the government and said to me, what are you doing? What's going on here? We've noticed satellite changes to the vegetation on your land. And I said, well, I'm running a grazing business, you know. That's what I bought it for. Anyway, the long and the short of that is that over the next three years, they set about prosecuting me in the court for using my vegetation to feed my cows. Vegetation that I paid for, that I bought, and I bought it specifically to run a grazing business. At the end of that prosecution process, I was ordered to pay $112,468.82 because I'd been using my vegetation to feed my cows. The decision itself coming out of, um, just to backpedal a bit there, I, that proceeding commenced in the magistrate's court which I represented myself. Um, it went to, I appealed to the district court, represented myself, and I appealed then further to the Supreme Court and represented myself. I did end up with a, a small measure of, of success, but I certainly can't call it just. However, within their decision, 
they actually said that the vegetation in question was not mine to use as I saw fit. Now you might say to yourself, well, how the hell does that work out? I said that, <laughs> most people, rational people would. I bought it, it was classified for grazing. However, I've been prosecuted by the administrator, by government, and they've actually turned around and said, well, it wasn't your property to use. Now, nowhere in the process of purchasing the property or at any time up to that prosecution did anyone from government say, oh, by the way, you don't have the right to use that vegetation. They just come along with a sledgehammer. So as you can imagine, that's led me to a, uh, a point where I'm fairly passionate about property rights and particularly private property rights in relation to land because that, as I said, is the most fundamental thing that we ever buy. So that's where I am at the moment. Um, in representing myself, I, I've literally spent thousands of hours studying law, case law and legislation. One of the most concerning parts of that is that the legislation itself actually still says that I've got the right to use my vegetation. And I'll just read you something that's it's not coming out of my mind. It's, this is a government document from the Land Title Practice Manual. Now, what the Land Title Practice Manual is, is basically the book of rules that government use in the administration of land, of all our land, whether you've got a house in town or 50,000 acres at Longreach. So, so what it says, this is coming from the government's mouth, for freehold land, it says outright freehold title is where the land has been alienated from the state and the ownership rests with, an, with the individual owner for an estate in fee simple. It goes on to say, this simply means that the state has no right or claim to the land and should the state require the land, it must acquire it from the owner either by negotiation or by resumption and payment of compensation. That's current as of today. Yet I've been prosecuted and told that I didn't have the right to use my land. Most people would say, how the hell can this be? That's the position we're in. The impact of what government have done to us, um, I can't really put into words. It's, it's like the main thing you work for in your whole life and it's just gone, taken away. I'd like to explain to you how this has all come about. In my research, the first thing I wanted to do when this all happened was work out where the hell is this coming from? Why, why is this? You know? You get hit with a sledgehammer, you want to see who's on the end of the bloody handle. So I set about doing a lot of research and I'll just give you a brief history of how this has come about. So back in 1996, the Queensland National Party leader Rob Borbidge became the Premier of Queensland. Many of you would remember that. In that same year, John Howard became the Prime Minister of Australia. In 1997, John Howard's government agreed to have Australia comply with the Kyoto Protocol. Many of you may have never heard of that. It's an international agreement with the UN. In accordance with that federal government agreement, or commitment, should I say, on the 5th of November in 1997, the Queensland National Party, that's Borbidge's government, signed a partnership agreement with the Commonwealth to access fund funds from the Commonwealth Natural Heritage Trust Fund, which was $1.1 billion from the sale of Telstra shares. So to be precise, on behalf of Queensland, that agreement was signed by the National Party leader, Rob Borbidge, it was signed by the National Party MP and Minister for Environment, Brian Littleproud. And it was signed by the Queensland National Party MP and Minister for Natural Resources, Howard Hobbs. On behalf of the Commonwealth, that agreement was signed by the Liberal Party leader and Prime Minister, John Howard. Liberal Party 
MP and Environment Minister Robert Hill and the Federal National Party Deputy Leader and Primary Industries Minister John Anderson. So if you ask yourself, well, well, why is any of this relevant? So what? You'd be unaware of the fact that it was this agreement that imposed obligations on the Queensland State Government to implement land use controls across all of Queensland. That is the government regulation of vegetation, water and all facets of land use. It was this agreement that brought about the start of erosion and theft of our property under the banner of the Integrated Planning Act in 1997. Now in June 1998, Peter Beattie became the Premier of Queensland. Many of you would remember that. Throughout this time, lured by the flow of cash from the National Heritage Trust Fund, ongoing pressure from the federal government to increase land use controls, such as vegetation clearing regulations and water regulation, brought about the Vegetation Management Act 1999 and the Queensland Water Act 2000. So the period from 2000 to 2004 saw continued pressure from the Howard government to further increase vegetation controls. And as such, the Queensland Labor government, the Beatty government, signed another bilateral agreement to deliver an extension to that original Nat Natural Heritage Trust Fund. That was signed in June of 2004. For Queensland, that agreement was signed by the Queensland Labor MP acting as um, Premier Terry McEnroth, and for the Commonwealth it was signed by the Federal Liberal Party MP and Minister for the Environment Dr David Kemp, and it was signed by the Federal National Party MP and Minister for Agriculture Warren Truss. That agreement was conditioned on amendments to the Queensland Vegetation Management Act that brought about further significant impacts for freehold land. And as you'd all remember, the Queensland Labor Party maintained those commitments for the further eight years. With a brief moment of slight reprieve under the state LNP government, we've faced those impacts right up until today. So that's where this comes from. And the primary thing we need to recognise out of that is that we can't just bash the Labor Party for tree clearing laws or violations of property rights in this state. Because essentially the National Party have, and Liberal Party have been behind this right from the outset. Indeed, they are the drivers of it. And it really matters not who was in power at a state level, it was the Feds driving it all along, as they do now. Property, as I've said, it's, it's land that's alienated from the state and they clearly say themselves that if, they say that they have no right or claim to it. And if they want a right or claim to it, that they must compensate us. Clearly government are negligent in their administration of our property. There's no other word to, ex to, to describe that. Dishonest. Negligence is, is careless disregard, and that's exactly what is happening. The, the, the institution, I, I don't like that word, but the institution of property must be protected because it's what we all live for. Many people have died for it. Most of us spend our life working to pay for it. And then perhaps it's handed on to, to our children. But it is the single biggest burden upon your existence is having somewhere to live. And if you're in farming, it's somewhere to generate your livelihood. We cannot afford to not protect that. And in protecting property, we're not opposed to environmental control at all. As much as I don't agree with a lot of the policy, and I would say quite happily that much of it is, for want of a better word, bullshit. 
The fact is, what I'm focusing on here is the fact that we have to protect our property. If government acting as the administrator want our land for conservation, they have a duty to compensate us. Government act for the people. If, if the people, the voting masses, want our land, they should be happy to pay for it. And if they're not, government have an obligation to say, well, sorry, go to hell, because we're not stealing. That's how it should be. But of course, that's not what's happening. Now, to resolve this injustice, we only have two solutions. One is political and the other one is judicial. And of course, I think you would all agree that the political solution should be far less painful and more appropriate than a judicial one. I'm sure many of you have heard cases, horror stories of judicial proceedings becoming nothing but a gravy train for the legal fraternity. It's for that reason that we should actually be able to get a political solution. We all have a choice to be part of that solution, or if we're not choosing to be part of that solution, we will indeed be part of the problem, because there is nothing in the middle. It's one thing to say, oh, well, you know, I don't know a lot about it, I'm not going to do much about it. I'll leave it to someone else. But you are actually being part of the problem by taking that, making that choice. The, the most easily accessible way that we can all assist in finding a political solution is to support political parties that are actually working for us. Now, I haven't come here to push a political wheelbarrow for anybody. But what I will do is give credit where it's due and I'll give condemnation where it's due. And if we keep voting for political parties that have got us to this point, we can well and truly expect more of the same. Indeed, we will get more of the same. Because it's not over. The taking of our property is not finished yet. Where I live, we're in the Murray-Darling Basin, and we're on the, the eastern edge of the Lake Eyre Basin. I gather, and someone will correct me if I'm wrong, you may well be in the Great Barrier Reef catchment here. Is that right? So, so many of you would be aware that government have legislated regulations for the Great Barrier Reef catchment, which will have a profound impact on all your properties in the catchment. Particularly from a grazing perspective, you are going to be facing over the next three years regulated minimum ground cover. So therefore that really equates to the fact that government are going to tell you how much grass you can use, which comes back to how many livestock you can run. And of course if you don't comply with that, well, you can look forward to getting dragged through the court and penalised. That same regime is already earmarked to be rolled out in the Lake Eyre Basin, the Murray-Darling Basin and the Gulf Rivers catchment. It will effectively cover the whole state. So if you're someone that's sitting on, um, should I say, developed grazing land with paddocks full of grass, and you think, well, vegetation laws haven't affected me. It's coming. It is going to affect you. Like it or lump it, it's on the way. That is why it is imperative to fight back now, not 20 years down the track when you've suffered, your community has suffered, and then you're trying to claw back from a position way behind. If we all knew how bad vegetation laws were really going to be back in 1999. Well, perhaps we wouldn't have them like we do now. There's been a profound reliance upon peak industry bodies, I call them so-called peak industry bodies, to represent us 
and fight the fight for us. And without wanting to point fingers and point blame, look where that has got us. It has not helped. They have actually been part of the problem. The same thing can be said for putting reliance on the major political parties that have historically stood up for, or purported to stand up for, rural and regional Australia. This is where we've got. So as I said, everyone has a choice and the easiest option that every one of us has is on election day. You don't have to spend hours, you don't have to spend weeks or days researching and trying to fight back. You don't have to turn up in a courtroom, but you do get a choice when you put pen to paper on who you choose to elect you. So all I say there is please think carefully because something needs to change. Okay, thank you.